Welcome. Welcome to our second service on this Lord's Day. For our evening worship, we continue to worship online. May God bless our service of praise. If you are visiting with us tonight online, we especially want to welcome you. Our God calls us to worship from Psalm 134. Says the psalmist, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Let's come before our God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the opportunities to worship in person. We thank you for the continued opportunity to worship online. We pray that you bless our service tonight, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, touch our desires, and transform our wills so that we praise you with everything that we have. Bless our prayers, bless our offerings, bless our singing, bless the reading and the preaching of your word in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening a hymn of praise is How Great Thou Art.
starting uh, today, we're going to be uh, begin a series on the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20, but then also uh, looking at these commandments through the eyes of the Heidelberg Catechism. So we'll be looking at our scripture reading. Scripture reading is from James chapter 1, verses 19 to 25. And then we're going to be looking at Lord's Day 34, which kind of basically lists off the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. So first, our scripture reading from James chapter 1. James 1, 19 to 25. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror, and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then we also look at Lord's Day 34 of the Heidelberg Catechism, which lists the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the father to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day, and therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, honor your father and your mother, and that so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Ten Commandments. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, so today I begin a new study of the Ten Commandments. We'll be looking at the Ten Commandments with the help of the Heidelberg Catechism. We'll see what the Heidelberg Catechism also has to say about these Ten Words of the Covenant, as Moses calls them in Exodus 34, verse 28. Congregation, it's, it's good to study the Ten Commandments. Why? Well, if for no other reason than that people in our culture today no longer know the law of God, much less care about the law of God. I mean, consider it. The Sixth Commandment says, You shall not murder. What's the news about but continual acts of terrorism, murder, mass shootings? In the U.S. and other countries, but also in our own country, and don't forget about de uh, abortion on demand in our country, and now also assisted dying. We've got problems here. You get the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. This is the commandment that addresses sexuality and marriage. This commandment is designed to protect our sexuality and marriage. But again, look at our culture. Our culture is absolutely lost when it comes to this stuff. We are confused. There are no boundaries anymore. It's not healthy. And is all of this not because we don't observe the first commandment in Scripture? Exodus 20 verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. I suspect that in our society we have an awful lot of extra gods around. We've got the gods of materialism and money and wealth and sex and hedonism. You name it, we've got it. And so chaos reigns in society, really. 
Oh, it may look kind of okay maybe on the surface, but when you look underneath it all, there's an awful lot of rot. There's an awful lot of rot in our society, but, but it's inside the church too. God's covenant people also do not really adhere, much less know the law of God. Where is our passion for true obedience? Are we being a light to the world? Are we? Our statistics for marriage breakdown are virtually the same as in the world. We too have sexual promiscuity, pornography, adultery, you name it. We too break the sixth commandment, the commandment on murder. Oh, maybe we don't actually murder en masse with a, with a gun or whatever, thank God. But sometimes we do everything but. Sometimes Christians do have their racist tendencies. Sure, in some of our homes, hatred is our guiding norm. It's what guides our behavior. And so is this not because we too have other gods? Here's the question. Do we really love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength? And so what this world desperately needs is obedience. And the place where it ought to start is among us. How important then that we have this series on the Ten Commandments. A series on the Ten Commandments then. Quick question. Uh, where are the Ten Commandments from again? Uh, they're from the Old Testament. And so I'm having a series on ethical guidelines for us, for Christians, from the Old Testament. The question is, is that okay? Is that allowed now in the New Testament age? Doesn't Paul say in Romans 6 verse 14, you are not under law, but under grace? And doesn't Paul also say in Romans 7 verse 6, we have been released from the law so that we have so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit? Doesn't Paul say that we are not under the Old Testament law anymore? How do we deal with that? Okay. Very good. Allow me to address that before I go any further. When Paul says in Romans that we are no longer under the law, what he's referring to is the Old Testament application of the Ten Commandments for that time. Hear me out on this. In Exodus 20, God gave the Ten Commandments. But, but when he gave the Ten Commandments, he also gave a whole bunch of other laws too, correct? He gave a whole bunch of civil laws, laws on how to own property, build houses, provide public justice. Basically, he gave a whole series of government laws to govern Old Testament Israel for that time. God also gave a whole bunch of ceremonial laws, laws on how to make sacrifices, laws on how to run the tabernacle and the temple, laws to govern circumcision, Passover, the jobs of the priests and the Levites. All these civil and ceremonial laws were an application, an outworking of the Ten Commandments for that time. Altogether, it was one big law system. When Paul says in Romans 6 and 7 that we are no longer under the law, what he's saying is, is that in Christ, we are no longer under that Old Testament law system. That system, as a whole, doesn't apply anymore. It's been fulfilled. It's been replaced by Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that everything of that Old Testament law system is gone now in the New Testament. No. In the Old Testament, part of that system was the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That commandment still applies today, doesn't it? Sure, and so do the Ten Commandments. The point is, there is some continuity between the Old Testament and the New. Sure, the heart of that Old Testament system, the basic principles of it, they very much carry on in the New Testament age. It's just that those principles, they're not applied now with the help of a bunch of Old Testament civil and ceremonial laws. No, they are applied through the help of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so while the Ten Commandments are found in the Old Testament, 
they still very much apply to us today in the New Testament through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so it's good to have a series on the Ten Commandments. Allow me to note some peculiar, uh, interesting facts about the Ten Commandments. What makes them so special and so unique? Four things. Number one, the Ten Commandments are a summary of all of God's law. All the laws that are in the Bible, be they about worship or money or sexuality, work and leisure, whatever, they are all subsumed under one or more of the Ten Commandments. In that sense, the Ten Commandments are a summary of all of God's law. So, so appreciate then, each commandment then addresses a whole different area of life. That's right. In that sense, each commandment operates as a synecdoche. You know what a synecdoche is? A synecdoche is something that represents a larger whole. If I, if I give you the keys to my car, what I'm really giving you is the whole car, right? My keys represent the whole car. My keys then are a synecdoche. What I'm saying is each commandment is a synecdoche. Behind each commandment is a whole bunch of stuff, a whole area of life. So every time we look at a specific commandment then, we're looking at that whole area of life. The Ten Commandments is a summary of God's will for our lives then. Number two, uh, the Ten Commandments, they're all reaffirmed in the New Testament. Not one of them is done away with in the, in the New Testament. Each one is reaffirmed. As a matter of fact, not only are they reaffirmed, but they are made richer, they're made deeper, they're made uh, more relevant. What do you think Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is? A large chunk of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is Jesus taking the Ten Commandments from, from Mount Sinai and explaining them and getting to the bottom of them, showing what God is really after behind each commandment. Jesus came to make them deeper. I think of Matthew 5 or 17. There Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. What does that mean? To fulfill them? That means Jesus came to fill them up. Think of, think of a balloon. When you fill up a balloon, you make it larger, you make it bigger. And you can read the letters on the side a little bit better. You, you, you fill it up. That's what Jesus does with the Ten Commandments. He, he fills them up. He makes them bigger. He makes them richer. So, never does Jesus abolish the Ten Commandments. No, he reaffirms them. He transforms them. In 1 Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul calls the law of God in the New Testament Christ's law. That's what they are for us now in the New Testament age. Number three. What's unique about the Ten Commandments is that they, well, they are uniquely given to us. All the laws that we find in the Bible, the, uh, of all the laws that we find in the Bible, the Ten Commandments are very uniquely given. Note, well, first of all, there's ten of them. Ten signifying completeness and wholeness. Uh, they were given on a mountain. Uh, before a whole congregation of God's people with lightning and with fire, no less. The people even had to wash and prepare themselves for the occasion. The Ten Commandments, they are repeated uh, twice in the Bible. First in Exodus chapter 20 and then again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The Ten Commandments, they were kept in the Ark of the Covenant for safekeeping. Uh, this one is interesting. They were given in the presence of angels. Angels were there. If you've never noticed, angels are always present at great uh, redemptive moments, right? At Jesus' birth, his resurrection, his ascension. Well, angels appear at Mount Sinai too. 
And last of all, the Ten Commandments were carved in stone, suggesting endurance, longevity. Actually more, they were carved on stone by the very finger of God. These commandments are meant to be permanent. Okay, three things so far that make the Ten Commandments special and unique. Number one, they, they are a summary of all of God's law. Two, they are reaffirmed in the New Testament, transformed into Christ's law. Three, they were uniquely given in the Bible. And number four, number four, the Ten Commandments, they are grounded in the very creation order of God. God designed the creation order to follow the pattern as set forth in the Ten Commandments. In the very beginning, creation was not designed that people murder each other and commit adultery and steal. That's not the way the creation is supposed to work. In the beginning, God made the creation order good. In the fall, everything gets broken down. And then in redemption, what does God do? Uh, he saves and he restores the order. He brings us back to the way things are supposed to go. So understand then, the more we get a handle on the Ten Commandments, the more we obey them, the more we walk in them by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the more we return to the peace and the shalom that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the very beginning. Of course, the Ten Commandments are in the order of creation itself. Which brings me to our text from James chapter 1. Just a few comments on that. In James 1 verse 22, the apostle writes, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. He continues, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What's the apostle saying? When you look in the mirror, you see a picture of yourself, right? You say, oh, that's me. I, I recognize myself. Well, when we look intently into the law, we're supposed to recognize ourselves there as well. We say, oh, that, well, that's a reflection of me. I see myself in that. In that sense, is the law supposed to define really who we are? James continues, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who does, who looks at, him, at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law, notice what he calls it there, the perfect law, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that, that gives freedom, that's what the Ten Commandments do, they give freedom. Some people think God's law gives restriction. Well, I suppose, to me, that's like, a, like a, a fish outside of the fish bowl. Outside the bowl, the fish may be free, but he's flopping around over the place. It dies. There's no freedom really there. Inside the bowl, it lives. It's free to live there well. And the same thing goes with God's law. So, says the apostle, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Absolutely. He finds peace. He finds shalom. That's what the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, reaffirmed and made richer in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, does for believers today. As it is. The Ten Commandments are uh, they're a good thing. That's why in the weeks ahead, we're going to look at each commandment one by one. Sometimes we'll have just one sermon on a particular commandment. Sometimes we'll, we'll have a little more. There's a lot in there. Congregation, it's time to wind this thing down. And to do that, allow me to, uh, to, uh, to note four concluding remarks. Four little concluding remarks. Number one, true obedience. It requires thorough reflection. It requires meditation. 
Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day, day and night. <coughs> Excuse me. The point is, true obedience requires meditation. It requires thought. It requires discussion. This is stuff we ought to talk about around the supper table. Number two, true living obedience requires modeling. This point is especially for our parents. Parents, if you, if you want your children to grow up to be living obedient Christians, then you need to practice it. You need to model it. And so if you are watching filth on TV, that uh, filth that has profane language, is full of promiscuity and sex and nakedness, and then we must not expect our children to gain a godly respect for these matters either. They won't. We need to model true obedience. Three, true obedience clearly requires the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Fact of the matter is the only way the law gets in here is if we ourselves are temples of the Holy Spirit first. That's why the Holy Spirit came. He came to take the law and plant it on our hearts. We really do need him. Which leads me to my last point, number four. True living obedience requires the right perspective. It all comes down to this. Why will Christians want to obey the law? Why? Because this is our way of expressing our love and our thanks to God for what he has done for us. Exodus 20 verses 1 and 2, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Why were the Israelites in the Old Testament supposed to walk in obedience? Because God brought them out of Egypt. God saved them. And didn't God save us? He sent his own son. He died on the cross to pay for our sin. Sure, he brought us out of the spiritual land of Egypt, and now we are on our way to the new kingdom. And so we praise him, we thank him, we love him, and we obey him. We have so much to be thankful for. So may we obey the Ten Commandments then, knowing that when we do, by his grace, we experience his shalom. James says it right, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do so, not only forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Amen. Our hymn in response, Have thine own way, Lord. Let's sing.
Let us stand together, if you are able, uh, to confess our faith uh, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. The words of our undoubted Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We've come to the conclusion of our service. After the benediction, we sing as our doxology, My friends, may you grow in grace. Lift up your hearts to the Lord, receive the Lord's parting blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you all. Amen.